but we will just let that happen. So go ahead, Crystal. Okay. So Emily is really great <laughs> and she's super prepared. And I'm like one of those like fly by the seat of your pants kind of people. I'm like this the, like, this, like visionary. <laughs> and Emily is really great at being both. So I had this cool idea that I feel like the universe gave me because um, somebody needed to do it. And I just had this idea that people should begin to share stories. And there was a time, like, I don't know if it was three or four years ago, where I like stopped caring what people thought about me and started talking more about the experiences that I've had as a mom, as a divorcee, as a combat veteran, um, uh, you know, working with a lot of men and being the minority and that sort of thing. And I stopped caring what the perception was of me and really just started living my truth. And it was because other people made me feel safe to do so. And one of the things that Emily does really well is obviously she created a group called She Built This, which we are all a part of, I'm assuming at this point, um, where we can all be ourselves in a safe space, share our stories, tell our truths, ask questions, and feel completely comfortable with that. So when I had this idea that we should have this event of women sharing stories, we listen, we give amazing feedback, and then we just kind of go on our way, but we are able to connect. I knew that Emily was the person that I should share this with. So I'm super grateful everyone's here tonight, and I will pass it over to Miss Emily to kick us off. Did you want to say um, who you are and what you do, Crystal? Oh, I'm Crystal Farley. Uh, yeah, I guess. But, you know, um, I'm really bad at that. I'm not a very good self-promoter. Um, but so I'm Crystal Farley, and I work with individuals to help them uh, establish really great stress relief strategies. So I work with corporations at a group level, especially during this COVID time, and then individuals, specifically females who are um, trying to balance multiple things. So uh, moms, uh, career uh, individuals, people that want to try to um, have all of the things and really help them develop strategies to be better humans inside and out of the workplace. So thank you for that, Miss Emily. Awesome, you're welcome. Um, and as Crystal said, my name is Emily Aborn and I'm the owner of She Built This, which a lot of you are a member of. And also I do like content creation and marketing. And I'm glad you said all those nice things about me because my mom couldn't make it tonight last minute, but she is gonna be watching the replay. So th there you go, mom, <laughs> all your hard work. And you got that nice, those nice accolades from Crystal. Um, all right, so just some little housekeeping. We're gonna all keep our mics muted, except for if you are obviously the one speaking. And then, um, for tonight's like offering each other feedback when people are telling their stories, feel free to just put things in the chat, like even as they come up for you during when someone is sharing. And then Crystal and I will read some of the comments um, out loud afterwards if they're pertinent. You don't feel like, don't feel like you have to say anything, but sometimes emotions come up and feelings come up and you want to tell somebody how great of a job they're doing. So feel free to put those in the chat. And for the people telling the stories, don't feel like you need to monitor the chat, okay? Like that doesn't need to be your concern at all. Just focus on what you already prepared to share. And um, yeah, that's all. So we are actually gonna start with Sarah James and Crystal is going to introduce her and read her bio. I am, I am. Um, so thank you all, first of all, all of you speakers for wanting to tell your stories. I really appreciate it. I know that this is not easy. Um, so Sarah, I like give you extra credit because you are starting, you're kicking us off. So Sarah Jane's Hogue uh, began her career in the financial services industry in 2012. She has several years of experience in human resources and is now an investment advisor representative of Primerica Advisors. Her office is in New Hampshire. However, she offers her financial wellness workshops to the greater New Hampshire and Massachusetts areas. Sarah Janes teaches these principles in a simple and interesting way, taking the focus off of products and placing it on fundamental strategies. She enjoys teaching people how money works in their lives and aspires to be known as someone who can help people get from where they are to where they want to be financially. She lives in New Hampshire with her husband, Tracy, of 23 years, and her four children, Kayla, Casey, 
Keegan, and Corian. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much for that, Crystal. And thank you so much for this opportunity. This is really exciting. Um, and I really started thinking today, well, I've been thinking about it since, like, what part of my story do I want to share, right? Like, there's just our, as women, right, how many things do we go through, do we live through, do we do? And um, I, I, I wanted to share, um, you know, so my background, my parents are immigrants from Canada, and they were both came from farms. I have, I actually added them up today, but I have uh, 21 first cousins and over a hundred second cousins. And the, the environment we come from, second cousins feel like first cousins. So out of all those cousins, um, I was the first to go, and I'm not the oldest, I'm in the middle of both sides of the family. I was the first to go to college. Um, so I grew up in an environment where women don't work. They raise children and their wives, and that's it. And because I was raised in that environment, I have realized that at some point, I internalized that, that I was not good enough, that I wasn't smart enough, that I wasn't pretty enough, that I wasn't good enough to be a working woman or to, to do something with my life other than raise kids and have and be a wife. And throughout that, so when I um, it was in high school, senior year, had a boyfriend, didn't like him, and thought, well, if I break up with this guy, now what? What do I do? And I did not tell my parents. I applied to, well, I went and saw my guidance counselor. It was May of senior year. And I went and saw my guidance counselor and I said, I want to go to college. And he just kind of looked at me like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, what, what, what are my options? What do I do? How do I do this? How do you go to college? Um, because I did all the forms for my parents. French was their first language. Um, they learned English through just moving here. If they didn't know a word of English before they, they moved here, they moved here after they got married. That, that, was, that was their honeymoon. Um, and so I did the entire process by myself. I did the entire application process. And my guidance counselor said, well, Notre Dame College in Manchester is still taking people and you can either be a nurse or a teacher. And I went, and eh, school teacher. I mean, that's how I decided how I was going to college. It was simply like that. <laughs> like, I'll be a teacher. And went and got, you know, applied for the financial aid, walked into the bank one day and didn't know what I was doing. I just walked in and said, I need a student loan. What do I do? And just signed wherever they told me to sign. And I put myself through college for four years, uh, lived at home. But when I came home, about two weeks before school started and I had gone through the entire process and had decided this is exact, this is what I'm doing. I went to my parents and told them how I was going to college. And my dad just looked at me and said, uh, you're, you're what? You're gonna pay all that money to be brainwashed? And was just blown away that, I, that that's what his daughter was doing. And they were, they were really surprised. Um, and my parents are really awesome people, but they don't understand the American education. They just didn't get it. And so I did very well in college, um, graduated. And that was the first time my dad had ever said that he was proud of me. He was so proud when I did graduate and couldn't, was so impressed that even though I didn't have their support, that I went through with it. I did the whole thing. I worked two, three jobs all through college. I was not that kid who, who I also was the captain of the crew team my sophomore year and up. So it was something like I never had five minutes to myself. I was either rowing or at a job or in school or studying. It's, it's how I went through my college years. And I took that into my first, my first career. Um, I did not go into teaching. I was very frustrated with the whole education system and how you feel like you get through, um, you feel like you get through um, to children and then the system takes that away from you. So I was so frustrated with the system that I did not become a teacher. And then, um, but, what, what happened moving forward is I got this amazing job in uh, a medical software company in Western Mass. And then a year into that, some recruiter called my phone at work and said, I need to fill a position at Mass General. I've heard a lot about you. I think you'd make that position. And 
I took this position at Mass General Hospital, loved, loved, loved my job. I was someone who was, I was the middle person between meeting with the nurses and doctors and meeting with the programmers and getting a software that um, I could, I was the voice between the two. Um, but then I had my first child, super hard for me to go back to work, but I did because my husband was second shift, I was first shift, so my, our daughter did not go to daycare. And then I had my second child and um, I just couldn't do it anymore. I uh, went in on a Thursday back from my 12 week maternity leave, very intentional so I wouldn't have to work a full week and call them sick Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and that Monday when I walked in, the, my boss knew that I was handing in my notice. So I stayed at home for 10 years. And in those 10 years, what happened to me is I had the same work ethic and wanted to be a good mother, a good wife, and never took care of myself ever and just focused on my children and my husband where my husband never had to do anything and I had four kids we had a kid every two years and on my fourth child it was so bad that I was like bathing three kids nine months pregnant and my husband was downstairs watching tv and I can't say it was his fault like it was just what my mother did so that's I took on that stay-at-home mom way too much um, and then after that through that, what started happening, that over-functioning, is I started resenting a lot. And then I became a very angry person for a few years. And I didn't, I didn't like this angry person that I became. And I was just reading and reading and reading and going to seminars and going to workshops and trying to not become this person that I was becoming. And I was ruining friendships and relationships. And it was, it, it, took me a long time to realize that it was me, not them, right? Because it was like, I just cleaned the house. I just paid the bills. I just put the kids to bed. Why aren't you loving me and telling me I'm the most amazing person in this world? It wasn't fair to other people to, to do that. But I realized that I felt like I was never, ever good enough. And then I met a spiritual director who showed me how to move everything that was in my head down to my heart. And that's what I struggled with the most is even though I was super intellectual and knew all these quotes and knew so much information, I wasn't moving it to my heart. And once I moved it to my heart, things completely turned around for me. Um, and it's the last few years, all those relationships have been repaired and have been so strong and life is just so amazing. So I know I, I think I went over, I'm trying to rush. Um, so I'm going to end it right there. But yeah, I think it was overcoming not being good enough was my thing was uh, a really big part of my story. And I had to go through a lot of yucky phases and not like who I was to get to loving who I am. Thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, Mary Jeans, thank you for sharing. And there's these nice little reactions we can all give to, we can all do little emojis here, like thumbs up and yeah. <laughs> um, Sarah Jeans, that was oh. awesome. And, and some of the comments, people, Lisa said, you put yourself through college without any preparation, you're unstoppable. We place so many expectations and standards on ourselves and um, what a gift you've also passed on to your children. And I said, which I can't remember because I can't find it. Oh, you were really working on your life from the inside out, which is so awesome. And that's like when things started to click for you. So I love it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Casey Matthews is second and I'm gonna introduce her. So Casey Matthews is a book writing and transformational life coach. She's an inspirational speaker and the author of A Mom's Guide to Creating a Magical Life, Eight Practical Steps to Feel Happier, Inspired, and More Relaxed, as well as the book Preemie, Lessons in Love, Life, and Motherhood. Both books won the Mom's Choice Gold Award and Preemie won the New Hampshire Writers Project Reader's Choice Award. She's been a featured guest on Yahoo, NBC Tonight, NHPR, Dr. Radio, and my podcast. Why isn't that on there, Casey? <laughs> um, Casey strives to help others find more happiness, balance, and purpose in their lives. And she lives in New Hampshire with her husband, two children, and their pup, Georgie Girl. Thank you. It is wonderful to see everybody. I'm just very honored to be here. I 
value and love the power of story so much. So I just think, Crystal, what an amazing idea that came to you and you found just the right partner. So very well done. So I will just dive in. Thank you. And when I saw the call to contribute stories about legacy, the first thing that came to mind was the legacy of anxiety that lives in my family. So I come from a long line of anxious people, but it's more of a low level underneath the surface kind of anxiety that most people on the outside wouldn't even recognize. So some of you already know me from my book about our daughter's unexpected premature birth. She was born weighing just over a pound and a half, four months too early. And as you all know, every story has a beginning, a middle and an end. And it would make most sense that my story of anxiety began with my daughter's premature birth and the months of hospitalization that followed. But my story actually begins with my son's birth two years before hers. My beautiful boy, Tucker, who arrived on his due date, weighing an even eight pounds. And when the midwife put him in my arms and I looked down into those big, newly awakened eyes, my first thought was, I have never felt this kind of love before. But immediately after that, the thought that followed was, how will I ever keep him safe? So that's where my story really begins. But the middle of this story is the next 20 years of me trying to control the world and keep my boy safe. Safe from the loss of his mom while his sister lived in the hospital for four months, safe from the terrible illness that almost took his sister two years later, safe from feeling like he didn't belong when we had to isolate because of his sister's vulnerable lungs, safe from the diagnosis of learning disabilities and the academic rigors of school, safe from injury on the sports fields and ski slopes, safe from heartache, heartbreak, rejection, loss, grief, uncertainty, unfairness, and any other potential struggles and pain he may have possibly encountered in the world. So it may not come as a surprise to any of you, but it absolutely did to me when Tucker came home from college in the spring of his freshman year and opened up about all the struggles he was having. And I listened as he quietly and carefully shared. And when he was finished speaking, I said, everything you just described sounds like pretty severe anxiety. And he looked up at me with those same big eyes I'd fallen into the day he was born. And he said, mom, you have no idea how bad it is. So fast forward from that moment to many months later, we're sitting together in the office of the therapist he'd been working with. The meeting had been scheduled for us to attend so he can open up and share his thoughts and plans for his future and moving forward. And it was near the end of the meeting after he'd shared all of this, the excitement, his plans, when I finally spoke up and I shared all my own fears and uncertainties about his future. But when I finished speaking, his therapist, Jim, sat forward on his seat and he said, good, good, good. You're owning the role of your own anxiety and all it's playing in this. And I was like, wait, what? My anxiety? And, you know, that's what I thought, but I didn't say it out loud. And I just sat there just like quietly dumbfounded. But I kept thinking like, my anxiety, what does that have to do with anything? Like, how could that be? But that was the moment I realized it. It was right there sitting in my son's therapist's office that I suddenly saw and understood so clearly that so much of the anxiety that he and our daughter as well were experiencing was coming directly from me. So after that session in the therapist's office, my son and I sat side by side at a local barbecue place for lunch. And I told him that I had no idea I'd been carrying all this anxiety and more importantly, the profound effect it was having on his life. So then I watched him hesitate before he spoke, but then he said, mom, I think you should understand that when you look at me, like you don't think I can do things or you're uncertain or afraid, it makes me feel even more so. And it was in that moment that I saw him and I heard him in a way I never had before. 
And I realized it wasn't my job to keep him safe, but to teach and model for him how to be strong so he could keep himself safe. So I put my hand on his shoulder, I looked him in the eye, and I promised that from that moment forward, I was going to own my own anxiety and take care of this. And I am happy to report that is exactly what I've done, but how I managed it and overcame it and helped others to do the same is a story for another day. But like I said, every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I wish I could say this is the end. But anyone who struggles with anxiety knows the work is ongoing. It's a constant challenge that requires attention and discipline. But I do hope this story ends with my kids, that this cycle of what was passed from my parents to me and their parents to them ends here. And in taking care of what I carry and taking 100% responsibility and ownership for what is mine, this unwanted inherited story of legacy will end here. Oh, I have to do the reaction. I love it. Thank you so much, Casey. So, but I love this question that is posed in our chat room of where is the line between loving your child and carrying anxiety? Because as soon as Casey started chatting about how um, her son was feeling the anxiety from her or the anxiety that she felt as soon as he was born and she looked at him. Emily and I have talked about this on my podcast a few weeks ago, like the thought that the worst possible thing could happen. How are we going to protect the people that we love? What are we going to do? And always waiting for that other shoe to drop. Super resonated for me, Casey. So I 1000% appreciate your story. And I actually really appreciate the fact that, you know, I never really thought about when I look at my daughter and I'm nervous that she's going to slip on the rocks that she might be scared to climb on the rocks. And that's not her story, right? Like, so my fear shouldn't be her story. So I appreciate what you just shared very much. I'm so grateful because that's exactly it. And you connected the dots, right? To just oh, yeah. There. Yeah, and what it took me so long to, to learn and what Tucker said to me is, when you believe in me, I can believe in myself. Love that. Right? I love it. Right. And it, Cause it's not that I don't believe in my daughter. I 100% believe in her. It's my own fear that is clouding the relationship. Right. So. But what we have to recognize is the thoughts, the emotions that we're putting out, they're like drinking them up with a sponge. So whether we're conscious of it or not, it's bringing that unconscious to the surface. So that's exactly what I was doing for 20 years, yeah. completely unconscious that I was doing that. So your daughter's young enough, you can now can it. bring it. <laughs> Wait, no, I'm doing it right there. Break that cycle, break the pattern. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing. I love yes. it. I wonder if it makes us as adults to uh, lighten up on ourselves when it comes to our own anxieties, because those are also things that have been sure. passed on to us from our parents, you know? So I think anxiety does come with a level of shame. Like you, you kind of mm -hmm. beat yourself up for why you feel the way that you do. And so I think, you know, knowing that it's, it's really coming from a long line of this, it helps to take some of that shame away from you. Beautiful. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And at my age, to still have my mom and dad call and micromanage my life, it becomes very obvious. Where so this is it never from. stops, Casey. It never stops, huh? Great. Well, it does, right? Hopefully it stops here. Like as we For her, not for me. Yeah. <laughs> It feels like the anxiety so often uh, of what we're afraid might happen ends up being so much bigger than even if it, even if there are challenges, like your son said, I can do this. You know, if you believe in me, I can do this. What a strong person he must be. Thank God. Oh. Right. I mean, they are our greatest teachers. They come here and if we can stay open to learning, that's all this journey, I guess. That's beautiful. Wow. I love that. Yay. Yes, yay. Thank you.
do we have to move on now or can we keep talking about how my anxiety rules my life okay so <laughs> <laughs> all right so i gotta introduce the next one but mary ellen mary ellen fish so if you joined us late uh when i started my business late 2018 early 2019 mary ellen was probably i think she was the most um the most charismatic person that i had met during networking that i remember her to this day and i am speak so fondly of her but she is going to be sharing her story and she was born in new mexico which i didn't know so there's a lot of fun facts in her bio um she and her younger sister who i believe is on our call right now um were raised in new hampshire by hard-working parents mary ellen met her now husband dan on the high school track team and they have been together ever since. That's so cute. Um, especially because I've been divorced twice. Um, after studying environmental science, she worked in several labs and in quality assurance for a large pharmaceutical company. She now lives in Chichester with her husband, their three beautiful children, and their wild dog, Jazzy, as she builds her business, helping families achieve financial success. So Mary Ellen Fish, you are up. Awesome. Thank you very Good much. Good to see you. So can everybody hear me okay? Because I have a microphone if it's bad. Thumbs up? Okay. So uh, I remember Crystal quite clearly as well. And um, I love that my sister is on the call because growing up, um, charismatic is not, uh, and Julia, <laughs> charismatic is not a verb probably that would be used to describe me. I was very quiet. Um, and I realized now as a grown up, Casey, holy moly, I need to talk to you. Um, that growing up, you know, I had big emotions. Um, and even in my family where we talked about emotions, I felt like I didn't fit. <laughs> I felt like I didn't fit at school. I didn't fit at home because my feelings always felt so big. Um, and I think we, we fell into a pattern, uh, perhaps due to anxiety and fear, Casey, that I always kind of felt like people were trying to protect me um, out of love and kindness, but it made me, I chose to feel fragile. Um, and I realized that was my choice. And um, it came to a head when, you know, I happy life, you know, married my high school sweetheart, you know, great family, great children. Um, so I was a happy person, but I had a lot of pain inside. And um, one day we were on vacation and having just the best time and I got the worst call. Um, and those of you that may know, I often have poor cell service. And this was a really bad time to have poor cell service because my mom and my dad and my sister couldn't get a hold of me um, to tell me that my cousin had died. Um, and he was not like a cousin like you think. He was like our older brother that lived in a different state because we had a really small family. He used to come and babysit us and he was the best babysitter ever. We probably did things we weren't supposed to do, but he was a big part of our lives. And I was really, really excited for my daughter. She was two at the time. I was really excited for her to, to grow up with him and to feel that love. So when my poor sister was the one that got a hold of me, I yelled and I screamed a scream that I'd never, ever experienced in my life because I felt robbed. I felt like it wasn't fair. And I had a lot of anger and a lot of fear. And then I was like, okay can't do that. <laughs> like I'm a mom, we're on vacation. We're literally in a, in a house with 20, you know, 15 other people. So I just bottled that up and like, like, all right, well, we gotta, we gotta keep going. Um, and then I got home and I was like, oh my gosh, I was just on vacation and I have childcare families to take care of. Like, I can't take more time off. I was playing the victim role and I stopped because I said, I can't, you know, I cannot take care of children right now. And that's okay. Like it wouldn't serve them for them to come to my house right now because I'm a mess. Um, so I called them and of course they're amazing. And they're like, take all the time you need. And then, okay. Obstacle one, obstacle two, I didn't think I could be sad and be upset and be a mom because I always 
felt like strength. I equated strength with, you know, not crying and, and, you know, being strong meant not feeling, I guess is what I thought strength was. Um, and I was in the pediatrician's office and I said, I don't know what to do. Like, I am, I am really upset and I, I don't want her to see. And my pediatrician of all people looked at me and she was like, it's okay for her to see you sad. This is how she learned about how to deal with sadness, how to deal with anger. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm allowed to feel. Um, so in that, I decided the way I grieve is different than other people. And I chose to step into that. And I didn't realize at the time that that was a really big turning point for me. Um, because um, if my sister had a mic, she could say a lot of our family, like, we were there when people, you know, at the funerals and whatnot, but you kind of stay out of everybody's business. Um, and that's just not me. I don't stay out of people's business that I love. I'm like up in their business. So I decided to go down and, and be with my aunt, even though she had told us that she wanted to be alone. I felt like she was saying that for us, for everyone. She didn't want to be a burden. You know, my mom had went and helped with all the details, you know, got the services situated, but because of the nature of what happened, there was gonna be about two weeks before the funeral actually happened. And I'm like, there's just no way that she should be down there by herself. So I went and I was a grown up. Like that was the day I stepped into the role of a grown up in our family. And um, I had a blast. I mean, it was awful, right? Like obviously, but we like, we looked at pictures and we found, you know, we put together a, a poster and I sadly saved a lot of the hard work for the night before the funeral when my sister came. She thought I kind of had it done, but I didn't. Crystal, I think you can relate to that with you and Emily. But um, <laughs> but we put together this amazing slideshow. We stayed up all night, we wrote this thing, and then we're like, who's gonna say it? Who is going to get up in front of all of these people and speak? And everyone's looking at each other like, not me, I'm not gonna do it. You know, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cry in front of all these people. And I literally felt like I was the last person qualified to do it because I knew I was gonna cry. I knew I was gonna be a mess and I had always tried to hide that. Um, but that day I was, I, I stepped up for my cousin and I stepped up for myself because I'm not fragile there is strength in stepping up and doing something you're super afraid to do, like go on Zoom and tell your story. <laughs> um, so I found my strength and of course I cried and my sister stood next to me the whole time, completely ready to step in if needed. We had it all written down, um, but I was able to make it to the end and you know, reading it with, with, with the emotion and everything, it just, it really meant more. Um, and I didn't, I didn't try not to cry. Um, and that was a huge turning point for me. So I didn't even know that's the story I was going to tell today. Um, and then I realized, Emily, I didn't tell you this, but as I was typing, um, the day I was writing the story was the day that he was in the car accident. And I didn't even know <laughs> because I don't, you know, it's COVID. I don't know what day it is, what date it is. Um, I almost had this day wrong, <laughs> but that's why, like that story was speaking to me and I didn't even know that that's what I was going to say. Literally no idea that's what I was going to say, but that's my story. And thank you all. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Crystal, for the opportunity. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And I'm glad that is what you said, um, because it was beautiful. And, and Casey said, it took a long time for her to realize that in being vulnerable, we're actually showing our greatest strength. And I totally agree with that. Um, and she also said a lot, two people said that they love the moment you can name when you became a grown up. <laughs> Even though my daughter was two, <laughs> it still wasn't a grown up. <laughs> um, and then awesomely strong woman, Sarah Jane says she heard for many years that she is also too emotional. 
and tried to bury that side of her. And I just want to share this little story that happened to me the other day. Mary Ellen, I actually think this might be helpful for you as you go forward, even from here. So I was feeling this emotion that I often push off, okay? It's something that just pops up for me a lot and I just ignore it. I'm like, don't have time to deal with you, right? So Sunday, I was completely annihilated, tired, because I had gone to the beach with Crystal and her daughter, actually, on Saturday. And that, for old, like, for ladies past your 30s, it's like a workout. <laughs> you go swimming. Oh, my God. So I was so tired. I was laying on the back porch, and the feeling popped up. And instead of ignoring it, like, I don't know why, but I just was like, you know what? I'm just going to get really super curious and feel this emotion, like, every single bit of it. And like, I went deep, like for 10 minutes, I was like feeling this feeling. And when I stood up again, I had taken it from like probably a 10 of intensity to like a two. So yeah. I actually think that feeling might be a big strength, not a weakness. Like that actually Huge. helped me to move through that, you know? I'm a master avoider. You're like a superhero when you actually like yeah. sit with it, yeah. Yeah. Love it. There's okay. one other thing. There's one other thing I want to throw in there before we move on. Cause there's incredible, like, I mean, I just can't wait. There's two more stories I really want to hear, but, um, Mary Ellen, you said something like, Oh, my cousin, I got this call that my cousin died and like, he wasn't like just any old cousin. Yeah. Okay. So us females, this whole comparison thing, like it's a bunch of crap. Stress is subjective to who we are. So it's not going to be the same feeling for me as it is for you. And just own that. Like you didn't need to explain that. It's okay. It's okay. Cause you want to know what, if, if my cousin died, it might not be the same thing for me, but that doesn't matter. Right. So right. we love you and thank you for sharing and you don't need to compare. It's all good. No yes, explanation I'm necessary. I'm glad you said that. That is a really, really good point. Cause that, that struck me too, as we don't need to explain our relationship with yeah. someone and say, oh, it was deep though. You know, it's not just any cousin. So, yeah. And, yeah. Okay, enough of me. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to introduce Lisa Arnold, who is a photographer with a studio, a beautiful studio, I should say, in Keene, New Hampshire. And Lisa did not send me much of a bio. So I took creative license and wrote who she really is because she does not know how to toot her own horn but she is always like listening so deeply and sharing about other people so this is what i wrote lisa has an exceptional eye and she photographs women in a way that shows them the true beauty of who they are she is also the host of her own podcast how do you want to be seen and right now she's working on a project called 40 over 40 which highlights the accomplishments and pivots of women who are making changes in their lives. She is an expert at listening deeply. She 100% fully cares, and she is always showing women the true value of who they are through not just her photos, but just like through everyday interaction with her. So, wow. Can I throw <laughs> one more thing in there? One more thing. Yes. So, Lisa and Arl, we've never actually met face to face, no. but we have this amazing virtual relationship. Um, I love Lisa. So the one thing I really appreciate about her before she gets started is that she supports people without asking for anything in return. And I feel like this day and age, it's really hard to trust people because they always want, it always feels like they want something back. But Lisa shows up, gives feedback and is just 100% supportive regardless of what the outcome is for her. And I genuinely appreciate that. So I am wow. so grateful that you're here, Lisa. Thank you. It's just so kind of both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a quote from Amelia Earhart. She said, the most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. And I love that. I carry it with me because I feel like that empowering thought of being tenacious, where you can make it through things. But I can't dismiss the first part of what she said, that sometimes the most difficult thing is the decision, especially when your heart is involved or if you feel alone. So about 18 years into my marriage, my husband came home one night and he was wild-eyed, 
and came right up to me and started saying, wop, 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 wop. I had no idea what was going on. It turns out he was recounting or reliving a time when he had repelled out of a helicopter and ran toward his first kill as a very, very young man in the military. The thing is, up until that realization, my understanding of his experience in the military was that he walked on the Berlin Wall and got drunk in bars in Germany, and that was it. So it was pretty jarring. Go back about a year prior to that, we thought he had a kidney infection or maybe a, a cracked rib until the doctors told us he had what's called a saddle pulmonary embolism, meaning a clot in each lung connected by a third clot creating a saddle. So it was painful, which led to a lot of painkillers and honestly it led to some horrific, horrific times. And it's my belief that that trauma, preluded by a lifetime of trauma, led to the wop, 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 wop. It was just like his mind said, enough, it's just too much. But oddly, when he did that, there was a part of me that felt hopeful. It explained why he had become so, so withdrawn and so angry to the point of rage, uncontrollable rage. But I don't want this to be about trauma or rage or being a victim or being a martyr, any of those things. I love that the theme was about togetherness and legacy. I want to focus on the core group of friends who came together <laughs> and they showed a love. <laughs> I practiced this and this did not happen. Um, a love I will never forget. And they were neither judgmental nor were they enablers. So if I had said, you know what, I'm done, they would have said, okay, we adore him, but okay, we understand, how can we help? And when I instead said, I'm just not ready to give up, they said truly, Honestly, they said, well, you know, you can't change him, right? And when I said, yep, they said, okay, how can we help? The, the result of that depth of support is such that the legacy, the legacy is threefold for me. First, I want to be like them. And second, I learned that I can make it through anything. It may feel like it's going to kill me, but as long as it doesn't literally kill me, I can make it through. Not always by myself, but that's the third part. I'm not by myself. And that's incredible. That lesson learned makes me feel a connection to that quote, that the most difficult thing is the decision to act and the rest is merely tenacity. The fears, this is what Amelia Earhart said. She said, the fears are paper tigers. You can do anything you decide to do. You can act to change and control your life and the procedure, the process is its own reward. Sorry. <laughs> Why are you sorry? Don't be sorry. We all do. I'm doing it. Are you like ready? Because this never happens, but it might. <laughs> Lisa, you're fine. Thank you. I just didn't expect that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. It seems like we all need to apologize for feeling different ways that we feel. All you know? of us, every single one, yeah. Yeah. F that. Lisa, that was beautiful. And thank you for sharing how your friends like mm. came around you like that. Like, I wanna be that for you. I wanna do that for everyone in here, you know? And I know that you do carry that legacy. Like, that's exactly what I was saying in your bio is you deeply care and listen 
for everybody that you come into contact with. You and Crystal have a virtual relationship where you've never even met in person. She already feels that way about you, you know? So you are carrying that torch and it's, it's beautiful. Well, thank you. I will say that I am a believer in God and I will say that they were ushered, ushered in. They were what you needed when you needed them. And they will always be. Yeah. We're like 20 hours apart and they are right here. So, oh. yeah. So are you with your husband today, Lisa? We're separated. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is better. You know, it's less pressure for him. So sure. I'm, I'm the needs. best friends with my ex-husband. I'm actually grateful that we're exes. Yeah. My hope is that he continue. He had some um, treatment that has removed the PTSD. Oh, good. But because it started when he was so young. It's like he has to learn how to live. He has, so having oh, one yeah. more responsibility is just not good for him right now. So Yeah, that's what I always tell people is, you know, people join the military for a reason, Yeah, <laughs> right? Like we're looking to escape so many things. Mm -hmm. And then when we're in the military, even more things happen. And we haven't dealt with any of the things from before. Yes. And so we're in this extremely vulnerable state and it just compounds and compounds and compounds. And unfortunately, innocent people like yourself or, and you know, we don't mean it. We don't and mean him. It. I mean, he didn't, yeah. he didn't ask for any of it, you know? So. Mm. Well, yeah. thank you for understanding. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. <sighs> okay. There's a, plenty of people that love you in the chat. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can see you. all of this, but no. <laughs> we all love you and you're beautiful no. and strong. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to get some wine right now. So I'm <laughs> listening. I'll just be right back. <laughs> We're kindred spirits. Do you realize that, Emily? <laughs> Lisa and I, we just, we're connected. Are we ready for the next? Liz, yeah. Liz Larson. You got to, oh, do we have a, where's, okay, there you are. You're dialed in. There's two of me. It, okay. So I can see everybody on one. Okay, so let's look at Liz who's not Elizabeth, because I already messed that up. So Liz Larson has been a life, has been on a lifelong journey with money. There's a lot of money people. I know you said that earlier. A lot of money like, people. I just hmm. don't like money that much. Okay, so her work is centered around helping people untangle their relationship with money. So you're with, like with me, girlfriend. Get clear on their goals and invest with intention. You graduated from Wellesley College like a million years ago, which I don't believe because it's because I finally got back to the hair salon. That's why. Oh, so we're not going to tell you. Otherwise, sister. you'd believe me. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't believe. You. With a degree in economics and a minor in English, after school she worked as a biotechnology analyst at a technology investment bank. That's fancy. Then as an equity analyst at one of the largest hedge funds in the world, Citadel, and finally at Fidelity, both as a fixed income analyst and in marketing. She That's stayed awesome. with her four kids. You wear so many hats, I can't even keep track. Okay, so until the youngest made it to first grade before restating here in New Hampshire at Edward Jones, just in time to see the pandemic. Welcome to COVID up close and personal. Welcome, Liz. We're excited to hear your story. Oh my gosh. Well, I feel like, um, first of all, I feel really humbled to be here. With this all is a you hard guys. act to follow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You guys are amazing. And I really, um, I have not ever, I have not done this before. So this is new to me and I appreciate that everybody shared what they shared. And, um, it's really, it's such an, you know, testament to you, Crystal and Emily to have built all these groups. I mean, I feel like I just keep learning about how all these groups intersect and um, they're just amazing the way everybody shows up for each other over and over again. Um, so my story was really um, kind of just, you know, I think the themes, the themes are all there um, in that I remember graduating from college and the dean of our college gave the commencement address and I remember she said her like tagline was to embrace your face and I remember sitting there and being like embrace my face like phases are for toddlers and teenagers and like 
I am an adult. I'm going to be a serious person here. Like I'm not, I'm not going through a phase. This is real life. Like it's starting now. And so we went out of the gates, you know, like ready to go. Um, so, you know, went out into the working world and, and the words like always kind of stayed in the back of my mind. Um, but honestly, like didn't really mean anything for, for many, many years as I sort of like worked my way up, worked my way up, married my husband who thank God I've known since high school. And I feel like kind of knew, knew me from it, you know, in a different way. Um, and and that all sort of was good until we kind of got stopped in our tracks. Um, his mother um, was diagnosed with cancer, which moved us home from across the country. So while it was a terrible diagnosis at the time, it probably was the best thing that could have happened to us because it brought us, brought us back to New England and back to both of our families. Um, and during that time, we decided we wanted to start a family. And so it started that age old debate how do you do it all like and not just family with kids but like family capital f like family like your parents your in-laws your aunts your cousins your friends you know all these people that make up this fabric of our life um and so you know we started thinking around that and um you know but we're still kind of rushing forward i got stopped again when I tried to get in an elevator six months pregnant with twins and, and ended up passing out, hitting my head and um, being escorted to the hospital and then out of my working life, basically. Um, and I remember saying, you know, the words kind of stuck with me and it was like, embrace your face. Like, this is, this is what they were talking about. You got to make the best of it. You got to embrace where you are. And um, I ended up staying home for a long period of time with the kids. And I feel like I started, you know, to get more present with that and, and really understanding, like, you know, how to just sort of be more in the moment and what all these different phases of life were, so especially with little kids. You know, they're really acute and intense. And while there were a lot of really happy, wonderful times, um, I also feel like I felt you know, increasingly dissatisfied. And while I was always like really present with my kids, I was less and less present with myself. Um, and that's been part of what I had been trying to unravel um, probably, you know, in the last five years more intensely um, in trying to understand, you know, how not just to embrace your phase and not just to let the phases happen to you, but to embrace who who you are and who you really want to be and not, um, you know, I feel like I was letting a lot happen to me. Um, people, you know, I was taking care of people, people were taking care of me and I was just part of this continuum and I needed to get out of that and, and really, um, sort of find my own way. So that's sort of what the journey I've been on for the past, I'd say like a year. Um, and it's been fun because I've re-met this phrase and it's something that has just stayed with me. And it's like, here I am, new phase. And it's different and it's new and we're just gonna embrace it. And again, I just go back to this community that it has really helped make it so much fun because I feel like, um, you know, the work is part of it, but it's also just getting to relearn all these different pieces of your life and sort of synthesize all these different elements. I mean, anyway, so it's a real gift. Thank you. That's a lot of adjustment. Yay, I love it. Oh my gosh. And, and that is such a good lesson for all of us. I think especially right now when the phase is always changing and always uncertain, like mm -hmm. just being present and, and being where we are. And Liz, I'm excited for you to learn more about yourself if you've already had like, <laughs> such great revelations because I'm watching, yeah. I'm watching these things happen for you and it's exciting. So I'm excited for you to even get, you know, deeper into it. Thanks. Um, Mary Ellen. Let me ask you a question. How do you yeah. become open to these things? How do I become open to what? Like these like changes. In your because life, a lot, of, a lot of times we fight them, right? So, like, mm -hmm. we sorry, I'm, I'm looking at two of you because ah. you're in here like three times now. Hold on, sorry, <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. I don't know what I did. 
<laughs> so we're faced with adversity adversity we need to pivot we change things like how are you open to these things like covid came and you were like ha 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 like here's covid like no, what no 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 there was no <laughs> ha 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 for me i was mad so no i've been i mean i had been planning this for like talking about it studying blah, 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 for a year and it just happened to coincide that the day I stuck my key in the door was the day my kids were like, ah, there's no school, we're done. Um, so that I was not laughing when that happened. But, um, but I think in many ways, honestly, it, it really um, has been, I mean, it's been a hard thing, um, but in my house, what it has done, and my husband has always been really hands-on, but he, I mean, this is hands-on in a totally new way. And it's been really, I can't, I would have said that we understood each other pretty well. This has totally redefined our relationship, 100%. I mean, you know, it just, it, you know, I understand when you walk in and you see him, you know, and he's doing his um, Mr. Mom imitation of, you know, his hair is frazzled and he just, you know, wants to put his PJs on and have a glass of wine. I'm like, I know how you feel. I get it. I've, that's been me, you know? And he knows what it feels like to say, like, can I just sneak off and just do this for like half an hour more? I'm just not quite done, you know? And I, it, it's been a great equalizer for us. Yeah. I love what Casey said. She said, uh, and just full disclosure, I don't have kids, but I'm going to read this from Casey. <laughs> um, she said, it's so much like our kids. When we feel, when we figure out where they are and feel like we've mastered it, they grow and shift and change. And I guess we do too, always in new phases. I love it. And you know what? I come back to a lot, even before the pandemic, before 2020, things were always uncertain. It just became really, really obvious to us this year that like we right. don't have control and things are not certain. You know, like it just kind of was in our face, but it's always been like that. You don't have any control over tomorrow and you never have, you know? But I think this year really cemented that for us and showed us like how fragile every little bit of what we consider stability really, really is. I have to say, as somebody who also does not have children, listening to all of you ladies and the impact that you have on your children. I, I mean, I, I keep hearing that parents just don't know what they're, you know, we do the best we can and then your kids are like 20 and need therapy forever. <laughs> but the fact that you guys have decided, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> you've decided who you want to be, that alone, that mm -hmm. alone teaches your children it gives them permission to be whoever they want to be. And I think that that is so huge, so huge. Coming from a non-mom, but you know, I'm a daughter, so I know what it's like to you know, have plenty of parents. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really impressive. Yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna invite anyone to unmute their mic and just you know, say your kind of last words. I really want to thank everybody who very boldly and tremendous. Boldly, yeah, tremendous. yeah. Us. It was really beautiful. But I just want to open it up in case anybody wants to chime in and and say something. And if you don't, that's okay too. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say like the stories that were shared tonight are so incredibly empowering um and i just think this you know again to emily and to crystal that this is just something that just makes me so feel so blessed and grateful that i'm not alone right i'm not alone and so many things were said tonight that were just some some just such awesome nuggets that is like yes me too yes me too yes me too right and it just it's so empowering it is so empowering and it puts us in such a better place so thank you everyone i'd like to say as well i, I just appreciate the courage that it took mm -hmm. to take the time to try to put into words what obviously you have felt so deeply and during this time where we don't have as much contact as we wish, it's um, it's a wonderful time to be able to experience what you what you're sharing. So thank you. I'd also like to thank all of the women who shared their vulnerability because it really is your strength. 
and um, yes, tears and of joy and tears of sadness, all of that. And one hour of time is just amazing. So thank you for, for being who you are. You are just beautiful souls. And um, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Um, this was lovely. And we will do, we, Crystal and I decided we're going to do one every quarter to kind of keep it like seasonal um, and, and keep this going. So thank you. And I thank you enough. You guys are absolutely incredible for sharing. Yeah. And thank you for joining and listening to our audience because that's pretty incredible too. Yeah. They'll all be speakers at some point. Not that. <laughs> right, Michelle? Yes. <laughs> Next time. Crystal, and this idea that, you know, the people who stand up and share their story out loud and speak it out loud, it is inspiring, but all of us have a story. And when we bring it to light, it loses its power and inspires others. So whether somebody chooses or not to share it and speak it with others, even just writing it down or totally. even just yeah. whispering it out loud on a walk to yourself, bringing it from the depths out into the light is just such an act of taking away the power from whatever that is. So just had to add that a little bit. Yeah, you're totally right though, because why do we need to be defined by that? And yeah. why do we need to hide from who we are? We don't need to. Yeah. And we can inspire other people to sort of like, you know, bust out of their shells and their cocoon and, and not hide anymore too. So you're right, Casey. Thank you for that. When I saw Emily's post, it was, I was, it wasn't a great time that I saw it, but I said, tomorrow morning when I wake up, I'm going to write it down. That's all I committed to. I, I might, I said I might not send it, but like, I'm going to write down what I would say. So thank you, Emily, for you didn't even probably know me and you gave me a little push. <laughs> so thank I you. knew you, you sent in a sign once. Another thing that I did, you sent oh, in okay. a word. <laughs> um, Yeah, so okay, I wanna pose one challenge, not a challenge challenge, but you know what I mean, like an emotional challenge. I want us to pay attention to when we're apologizing yes. or, or explaining for something that we, like. I want us to remember that no is an answer in and of itself. You don't need to justify it. Like there's no before, after, during. It can just be a no. I love all the facial expressions right now are like. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just noticing when you say sorry, like I've been doing that this week and I notice I say sorry for my feelings. So just noticing where it is in your life that you say sorry is, is the first step, I think, to really coming to just accept that it's okay to be you and it's okay to be where you are. So, and now class is dismissed an hour early. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. I just love you all. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is Thank by the way, the universal sign that something went really good, I think. Or, or like we're all together. What is it, Lisa? Remember, Stacy always does this. On I love you. I don't know what this means. I love you twice. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I you learned it here first. So if it becomes an Instagram sensation, I came up with that. Um, Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.